This is episode 438 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. I am very pleased to be joined uh, this week by George Sharp. George is at the Marion Oil and Gas Company in Farmington, New Mexico, and he works as an investment manager there. But, uh, George, if I may say so, uh, you are one of the guys that uh, I, I think people really look to, not just in the oil and gas industry, but uh, around the state of New Mexico as somebody who's knowledgeable about the the nexus, if you will, of oil and gas and energy policy and politics in the state of New Mexico. So I really appreciate your taking some time out of your day to uh, to talk to us here. Uh, thank you, Paul. I don't know about expert, but uh, I have worked hard to try to understand uh, energy in general as a broader topic beyond oil and gas, knowing that uh, the world is doing everything it can to move away from oil and gas. And so anyway, trying to understand where it's moving and why it's moving there and, and what the reality of those alternative uh, energy sources really are. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. And we've got a lot to talk about. I've been uh, trying for a while now to get different people on the uh, podcast, on the show to talk about uh, the the issue of hydrogen hub and uh, hydrogen energy in the state of New Mexico. And so that's going to form the bulk of our conversation here. Uh, but before we uh, go down that path, could you talk a little bit about yourself and Marion Oil and Gas and just kind of your vision of the industry and especially the four corners here in New Mexico and uh, your Sure. You've got a long history of being in, in the industry. Um, well, I went to Color School of Mines and got a master's in petroleum uh, back uh, about the time dirt was uh, being deposited in San Juan Basin. <laughs> um, worked for 10 years with Chevron in various uh, capacities. And then 1990, came to work at Marion Oil and Gas and have been with Marion now for 32 years. Um, the uh anybody who understands our modern economy understands that it is 100 percent reliant on energy um, i think uh you know there is no doubt that the world will continue to need more and more energy and so the question of where this energy is going to come from particularly you know if we're going to ultimately move away from fossil fuels uh is is a critical conversation to have um and unfortunately uh ideology tends to drive that conversation emotion tends to drive that conversation rather than uh the math and physics of the reality of the situation and so i try to take a practical look at uh, various energy topics and try to put them in uh understandable common sense uh, ways of looking at them that uh, um you know, uh, help us realize, help the world realize. I think they just got a got a uh, message from the Ukraine crisis of how critical uh, oil and gas still is to our energy supply and to the running of not just the U.S. but the world economy. And uh, briefly, uh, talk about Marion Oil and Gas, and uh, you know, I know they're up in the four <laughs> corners, that. but. They are the best company in the world, Paul. You ought to know that. Uh, Marion, <laughs> small independent. Uh, J. Greg Marion started by uh, T. Greg Marion's grandfather, or excuse me, father, back in 1960. Um, took his life savings, moved up here, drilled a well, and it hit. And a very entrepreneurial co company. Uh, we've got a lot of investments into. Uh, we actually have investments in Baotech, who's generating hydrogen. We have investments in uh, solar companies. We have investments. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, the first opportunity to invest in nuclear, uh, because I really do think that nuclear is the long-term ultimate solution. So we're small, agile, 
um, energy company uh, that is open to uh, any investments in that arena and uh, outside of that arena, frankly. We, we have uh, investments in compressor company, rock crushing company in Midland. Um, and so we've got uh, a lot of money and energy in the support industries that uh, rely on energy uh, for their business. Got it. Okay. So you uh, love your uh, boss and your job. And I, I, I mean, certainly T. Greg is. I, I, uh, I do that. We, we are. Uh, is T. A great Greg, guy. by the way, just retired. I know. Yeah, February yeah. 2, 22, 22 at 2 22 in the afternoon. Hung up the that's, uh, that's the excellent proverbial. Uh, anyway, he's he's the, still the he's the CEO of the company. His son Ryan uh, took over as the president and and now uh, runs the day to day operations. But T. Greg is still involved and uh, uh, still uh, still a good friend. He and I grew up together. So excellent. Thought, well, um. Let, let's get into this conversation about hydrogen and the hydrogen hub idea. Uh, this is something that has split, uh, in many ways, the oil and gas industry, conservatives in the uh, legislature, and there's a lot of debate and discussion also on the left side of the political aisle uh, with regard to the merits and demerits of hydrogen. Uh, you know, when I think of hydrogen, I think, uh, you know, the elemental table, the periodic table, but I also think about the Hindenburg and uh, big explosions. Um, and, uh, you know, talk about the broad outlines of what hydrogen and a hydrogen hub could mean to New Mexico and okay. people's vehicles, et cetera. Well, let me first clarify to... Uh, whoever may be listening, that I am not an expert in hydrogen energy. Really, there are no experts in hydrogen energy because hydrogen heretofore has not been an energy source. Uh, there are no commercial large-scale hydrogen energy generation plants. And in fact, hydrogen, it doesn't make sense to use hydrogen to power the grid. Um, uh, and so uh, hydrogen has got a very unique uh, application and that is in uh, long haul transportation and heavy equipment operation, um, things that uh, you can't run on a battery and don't have time to, to, to recharge the batteries or can't change out the batteries or whatever. It's, uh, uh, nor can you have carbon capture at the, the point of consumption um, in a car or in a airplane or a, uh, a boat. And so um, hydrogen's got a unique application and frankly, it's the only real solution uh, technologically, unless you go, you know, if you say, well, ships can run on nuclear, um, yeah, it'd be hard to run a car on nuclear, hard to run a forklift on nuclear. And so uh, you can run ships on nuclear. You can probably, I don't know about airplanes, but, uh, uh, I'm not sure everyone wants wants to go to nuclear, but it's really the only solution besides nuclear uh, for uh, those uses. And so when you look at the economics of getting there, the economics of most of these new initiatives just don't make sense. Uh, you know, that's going to cost more. You don't change your energy source. Uh, and change your infrastructure and, and think that you're going to get away with it being cheaper. And so there's the, the, the tractors on the hydrogen energy hub can say, you know, this doesn't, <laughs> this doesn't make economic sense. And the, the only answer to that is, well, it doesn't make economic sense right now, but it's the only solution to this piece of our energy equation. And uh, we need to start working on it. In fact, uh, they're building four hydrogen hubs to begin that, begin that work on it, and we should be in a leadership position on that with uh, in New Mexico with our national labs, uh, with our ample uh, natural gas supply, which is and I don't know if we'll get into green versus blue hydrogen, but the bottom line is that <laughs> from a math oh, I... standpoint, green hydrogen doesn't make any sense. So. 
So getting hydrogen from methane is really the right way to get it. And uh, um, and so it's a, it just makes sense to have that hub here, even if you can't make economic sense of the solution yet. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about blue and green hydrogen, uh, maybe in a second. So physically, what are we, what are we doing with hydrogen? How do we get the hydrogen? And I guess that gets into the blue and green conversation. Uh, and then what, broadly speaking, without getting too wonky in terms of the uh, process, what are we doing with the hydrogen? And then why is it green? I know those are three kind of very big questions, but uh, in layman's okay. terms, what are we what are we doing here? The first point to be made is, is that hydrogen hydrogen is the most reactive element God created, and so it likes to form other compounds: methane, ethane, or excuse me, all the all the hydrocarbons, uh, ammonia, water is a, is a hydrogen molecule. Uh, there's thousands of molecules. Uh, with hydrogen as part of the, the deal, but there is no pure hydrogen on the planet because it's reactive. It wants to react and to create one of these other molecules. And so you've got to find an existing molecule that has hydrogen in it, and you've got to use energy to break that molecule apart. Methane, which is a carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms, is a very weak molecule. It's pretty easy to, to break those hydrogen uh, hydrogen uh, atoms off of the carbon atom. And, and what you're left with is uh, hydrogen and CO2. And that's the negative. That's the blue hydrogen process uses methane reformation. Uh, you, you come in with some sort of energy supply. It breaks up the, the hydrogen off. And, and the, you know what's left is hydrogen, pure hydrogen plus carbon dioxide. And it's the carbon dioxide that's the issue then. And if your primary energy source is fossil fuels also, then you have uh, more carbon dioxide emitted you know, from your primary energy source. And so um, you would have to have to make that a green process, uh, not green hydrogen, but to make it a carbon free or carbon neutral process, you'd have to add carbon capture onto that. But even when you add carbon capture onto that process and get to a carbon neutral situation, uh, the amount of energy used is still less than one third of the amount of energy it takes for the other process that's available, which is water hydrolysis. Um, H2O uh, is uh, broken up and you get pure hydrogen and water vapor uh, coming off of uh, um, the, uh, the, the hydrolysis process. But it takes that water is a very strong, stable molecule, and it takes a lot of energy to to break it apart. And so, um, it's so inefficient. You use so much energy breaking it up that the amount of hydrogen you have left uh, again has only a fraction of the energy it took to drive the process. Um, and so that, that's green hydrogen. It's using renewables as your primary energy source to, uh, in a water hydrolysis process that uh, uh, creates the pure hydrogen. Um, and that process, there is no CO2 emissions from the primary energy because it's renewables. And there's no CO2 emissions in the chemical process itself. Um, and so it's got the term green stuck on it. Uh, blue hydrogen again is carbon neutral, but you you capture the carbon uh, again, taking more energy to do so. Uh, but you capture the carbon from that process. What else is yeah? That's blue versus well. Green. So and, I guess my next question is more of a political question then, because um, you know we talked about, and I I definitely like to discuss a little bit of the internal conflicts within the oil and gas industry and kind of the broad conservative uh, orientation on this hydrogen issue. But uh, you know, you've got the governor, uh, who is not my idea of a conservative. Uh, she's <laughs> definitely had a nuanced position on oil and gas over her time in 
in office well, here in New Mexico. She got a very but, anti position uh, until she got elected governor, and then she had to moderate that because, frankly, she needs the money. Right, right. But uh, you know, the governor has been pushing for this hydrogen hub concept, whereas a lot of the, you know, radical environmental base has been pushing against it. And, uh, you know, in, in the legislature, they had success uh, in stopping hydrogen hub uh, legislation, although the governor in her uh, pro-democracy style, like it or not, she just decided to uh, use an executive order to place New Mexico into a hydrogen hub uh, with other states. So anyway, my point is, what is your take on the, the split there between the governor and some of the more moderate Democrats versus the the, the green uh, folks in New Mexico? I believe the green were against it. Uh, and this is a guess poll a little bit, but uh, um, primarily because it was still uh, promoting blue hydrogen and the use of fossil fuels. They don't want any fossil fuel. Uh, they don't care how inefficient their process is, but, but if you use fossil fuels in the process, that exits it out. And so I think that that was their main concern uh, for the, on the far left. The far right uh, it, it takes a position that, uh, you know, our economy is uh, much more important than, uh, you know, the, any future pain we may see from climate change and they aren't willing to do anything that's going to cost any more money for energy. Um, and then there's myself in the middle and hopefully a few others that feel that, uh, yes, we do need to uh, address our carbon emissions. And yes, this is one of the few solutions, if not the only solution for this particular segment uh, of our energy use. And we need to start moving in that direction, even if it doesn't make economic sense right now. Uh, it is still the right thing to do um, to try to uh, get ahead of that game. And maybe it makes economic sense in the future. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just still costs more for energy, but we're able to do it carbon free. All right. So to basically summarize the, the points here, the uh, hydrogen idea is much blue hydrogen even is much greener, so to speak, than uh, traditional energy sources where it can be used. Uh, but some conservatives, uh, and quite frankly, you know, I'll just say a lot of conservatives have issues with the uh, subsidies and other uh, kind of uh, things that are going to be required to implement hydrogen into our economy, at least in the near term. Is that, is that a good yeah, way to summarize I would say it? That. I would say that they don't like to subsidize. Uh, they like a free market. They don't like subsidized, uh, you know, uh, business and um, puts uh, other businesses at a competitive disadvantage. But the reality is we're not gonna get, we're not gonna get to a carbon free world without subsidizing, without the government promoting it. Uh, without some sort of a nudge, because the economics say, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, 50 years from now, they may look back and, and say, well, those economics suck, you know. Uh, but uh, today, the, what makes the most sense, what keeps the cheapest uh, food on the table, you know, and, and clothes on your back, and absolutely everything takes energy to, to grow, to, you know, create, uh, is to stay the course with what we're doing with no subsidies for any alternative. Uh, again, I'm, I'm in the middle. Uh, I think it's going to take, you know, the government to uh, promote and subsidize nuclear. And I really do think that nuclear is the, uh, it certainly is the only current uh, technically feasible carbon-free answer on a, on a grid scale basis, on a large scale basis. Um, and, but it's going to take, you know, it's going to take the government changing to, to make that happen, and it's going to take some incentives to make that happen. Um, 
And so I'm, I'm, I, I realize that there are those that don't like any incentives at all and, and feel like, you know, things need to be able to compete. And that's, but that's not going to get us where we need to on, uh, on our energy use. Right. Uh, one now, of the other things you said, if uh, you, you, you said, Paul, that hydrogen is, is greener than our current energy sources. And I, I'd like to point out that hydrogen is not a replacement for our current energy sources. It is because it takes one of those current energy sources to make the hydrogen. So it's not a replacement. It just allows you to use that hydrogen in other places. You know, if that energy, no matter if that energy source is coal or hydrocarbons, the primary energy or renewables, the bottom line is, is uh, if you're generating electricity and you got room in the grid, you are much better off putting that primary energy source directly in the grid, not making hydrogen with it, and then turning it out and ma making electricity for the grid. Um, hydrogen is not a grid scale energy source and will not replace the current grid scale energy sources. So that's, that's a good uh, opportunity to ask, what will hydrogen or what could hydrogen do? What could it realistically replace? And uh, if we can ballpark how much of the, uh, yeah, uh, of the CO2 emissions and whatnot, how much of that energy source can we replace uh, in terms yeah, of- Yeah, I, I, I don't have uh, specifics on that, but it's mainly replacing um, oil as the transportation fuel. Um, it's, uh, it's, again, its primary application is in uh, long haul transportation, heavy transportation, heavy equipment, high temperature industrial processors, which is replacing some natural gas, but primarily uh, its replacement, you know, its application is, you know, on uh, small transient emission sources where you can't have carbon capture on that emission source. You can't, on a, on a gasoline driven car, you couldn't capture the carbon coming out the tailpipe of that car and then, you know, take it to some injection well and, and uh, sequester it. Right. Um, but you can create the hydrogen, capture the carbon, sequester the carbon, and then run the car on hydrogen without any emissions. So that's where hydrogen's application is, not in powering the grid. Okay, so in, in, a, in a way you would say that a hydrogen car would be a viable thing and in a way that uh, hydrogen is competing with electric vehicles as uh, a, a zero emission style yeah, vehicle. It'll, is it'll that... compete with electric vehicles and there'll be a you know, in the, in the, in the short term, or excuse me, in the urban uh, local, you know, less than 100 miles a day, electric vehicles are pretty damn efficient. And of course, you got to, I mean, if everybody's driving an electric vehicle, you got the whole infrastructure deal that our infrastructure isn't set up to, uh, you know, push that many electrons out to that many houses. You know, most of the houses don't have the electrical service that it takes to add a you know, an electric heat pump and electric, you know, uh, charging the cars. And you do that throughout a neighborhood and all of a sudden that neighborhood, the, the wires aren't big enough. And so, but beyond that, uh, you know, electric vehicles are, are really efficient. And, uh, uh, you know, when you look at them in a small isolated uh, deal. And so I think they're gonna still have a significant piece of the market. I think hydrogen, Small well, hydrogen cars will have some piece of that market, but I think the, the bigger application for hydrogen is on uh, trucks, ships, airplanes, or uh, somebody mentioned today that someone's building a hydrogen airplane. Um, again, uh, applications where uh, currently running primarily on oil and the products from oil. Now, um, CO2 is associated with that a lot. <laughs> would you go to, you know, a hydrogen station, kind of like a gas station? What does that imply? Because um, 
I, I lived in Argentina back in 2001 and they were using natural gas in, uh, a, as a transportation fuel. And that required a little more uh, in the way of uh, kind of care uh, and, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, doing your own gas, pumping your own gas in the natural gas context was not uh, done down there for uh, for natural gas vehicles because of the volatility. Uh, hydrogen is pretty volatile as well. Uh, is this something you would have physical gas stations spread around or how, yeah. how do you envision that? Uh, well, um, <laughs> I've been told to actually have a, have a, a snapshot of a filling station with a hydrogen pump and then gasoline pump on the other one. So yes, uh, hydrogen, uh, our current uh, gasoline stations could be fairly easily converted to hydrogen. Uh, the whole storage and transportation part of it, uh, you know, you probably have to upgrade uh, the piping to, to make sure it's uh, of a grade that can handle hydrogen without getting it brittled and, and whatnot. But yes, uh, you could have normal hydrogen filling stations to fill it up just like you put gasoline in your car. Um, oh, okay. And, and so the, an electric uh, station, the, you know, you start replacing those filling stations with an electric charging station. Uh, the problem is instead of people driving in and, you know, taking 10 minutes to fill their car up and getting out of there, and then the next car coming in and the filling station, you know, with, with six pumps being able to handle so many cars an hour, uh, you know, you're gonna need, you know, five, six, seven times uh, the number of charging stations to handle the same number of cars and those cars are going to have to sit there, you know, for an hour to two hours, even a fast charging station, uh, you know, to, to get recharged. And so that's why electricity just doesn't make sense for long distance travel. Um, you know, that, that the recharge is, you know, unless you got plenty of time and you don't care about sitting there for an hour, hour and a half or whatever it takes, even on a fast charge, uh, it doesn't work. And so it doesn't work for trucking. It doesn't work for heavy industry that, that needs to operate, you know, right now. Um, and I can't wait in two hours to, to get my forklift back going. So, uh, yeah, hydrogen could be out there in stations. Electricity, again, it would be easier than electricity, uh, electric vehicles to, to put stations along the interstates and have... Uh, I have someplace to go up. All right. And uh, so realistically, when do you think uh, we might see hydrogen deployed in, in the U.S. economy or here in New Mexico? When would we have uh, vehicles, whether commercial or, uh, you know, cars you could go buy at your local dealership? Is this something we're talking uh, three to oh, five yeah, years? The question is, how, how long is the string, right? Uh, you know, there already are hydrogen vehicles and there already are, you know, uh, high, these other hydrogen applications. The question is, how long does it take for the infrastructure to get built and the market share to, you know, create a, enough of demand for that? Uh, you know, a, a decade on the short end, I would think, and, you know, probably two decades. You know, it's it's going to be... A major change in the infrastructure to uh, to move to that. I don't I don't see any of the green transformation happening anywhere as quickly as everybody seems to want it to. It's just not. All right. Um, now I, I want to talk specifically about the idea of the hydrogen hub uh, because you know we don't have a well we I mean electricity hub I guess you could say it's a power plant but that's. I, I'm, that's where I'm trying to find out what this actually means. Uh, what is the concept of the hydrogen hub? Uh, why is the governor behind it? Why is Biden administration putting subsidies into it? Uh, what does that imply in, in the real world? Uh, Paul, I, on, on that end of it, I probably know, I mean, you know as much as I do. Uh, and I don't think anybody really knew, well, what's supposed to go in a hub? Well, you know, I don't know, what do you want, <laughs> what do you want in your hub? 
you know, but it would be in my mind, uh, you know, what I think a, a hub would be would be uh, something that's uh, working on all aspects of the issue from, you know, uh, how do you generate it uh, to how do you uh, store it and then to promote those, you know, end use applications. Now, you know, what end use applications could you actually have at the hub itself? Um, you know, that's, uh, that's the deal. You're really creating hydrogen to be able to go out and be used in, in the end use applications that are already out there. You know, the steel mills that are already there. The, uh, and so, you know, and if it's transportation, then that's not really used right at that hub. You know, that's kind of, again, <laughs> out, out away from the hub. So what's the hub's role in, in that transition? And uh, to, to tell you the truth, I'll be very interested to see what the uh, four different, uh, uh, what four different areas are awarded that hub and what that means to each of them. Because I really, in my own mind, am not sure what would go in a hydrogen hub. Here's my, and even though I don't know what would go in it, uh, here was the reason that I supported it. Uh, with the legislator, wrote some letters to, uh, you know, some senators and, and representatives, um, you know, asking for them to support it. And and the main reason is this: number one, uh, climate change is an issue, and we need to do something about it. I do believe that. Uh, number two, hydrogen is the only real solution for this piece of the equation, for this piece of the puzzle. Uh, and mankind needs to figure it out. Uh, number three, uh, they're going to put money towards figuring it out at these four hubs. And those four hubs are going to go in somewhere. Uh, you know, uh, why not New Mexico? You know, just because you disagree that any hub's going to happen, if the hub's going to happen, then it might as well happen here. Uh, where we have control over it, where we get some benefit from it, where if there are spin-off industries that come out of it, uh, we're part of those industries. And uh, it just makes sense to participate uh, in that conversation and in that process than it does to uh, stock a process and cut your nose off to spite your face on a process that's going to happen anywhere. It'll just happen somewhere else. You know, it's kind of like the, the move to, on the other side, the, the environmentalist move to stop the production of oil and gas. Uh, well, you can stop the production of oil and gas and, you know, not produce it here in Mexico. You cannot produce the hydrogen here in New Mexico, but guess what? They're gonna, someone else is going to get that hub. Someone else is going to drill a well, you know, uh, in some other place, and they're going to provide that energy. And we're not going to get, you know, we're not going to be part of that if you you know, eliminate the production of fossil fuels in New Mexico. That didn't stop our need for them. And they didn't stop the fact that they're going to be produced somewhere else. And so let's be part of the process. Let's make it the best we can. All right. Now, uh, my last question for you is, um, so do you expect legislation to be filed again on the hydrogen hub, even though the governor did what she did? And the, the second part of that is, would you recommend that, you know, Mark Ron Ketty, uh, if he's elected governor, pursue this same thing uh, in the same way or in some different way? Uh, I do not know if it will be uh, reinitiated or not. Um, you know, and I know we're part of a four state consortium that's going after a hub, and I don't know what that means. You know, if they put it up in Timber, Wyoming, what the hell good does that do New Mexico? I mean, right. even though we're partners with Wyoming, so I, I don't, I don't really understand the consortium uh, going after it. How that benefits everybody? It's going to benefit, you know, whoever, and, and, unless the various pieces of the hub are somehow spread out, where they're working on, you know, storage in New Mexico, and they're working on uh generation you know and carbon capture in wyoming and and maybe you know the the end use applications in arizona uh i i don't know and i don't think arizona was one of the states i forget what the four states were so i don't know what the four state thing is so 
would I rather have the entire hub here in New Mexico, whatever the, whatever the heck the hub is and what it looks like? Yes, I would rather. Uh, so I would I would uh, think it would be good for Ron Caddy to say, hey, we want this in New Mexico. Uh, we have the labs, we've got the space, we've got the natural gas, uh, we've got the uh, geologic formations to sequester the carbon. Uh, you know, we've got everything it takes to do it all right here. And uh, uh, let's try to go it alone. Now, if we if we do that, and uh, I don't know what happens to the consortium. I don't know if Wyoming and, you know, the other two states kick us out or, you know, what happens if they get it and New Mexico's done. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what happens on the political end. I really just try to understand things on the physical application end uh, and not, you know, not, uh, not let the politics drive my conclusions uh, on, on where I think we should be headed. All right. Well, I appreciate your time today, uh, George. And uh, all right. Well, uh, anything, anything else you want to share information wise before we, uh, in the show? Uh, I'd like to just um, go through the four conclusions that I had uh, from my hydrogen video. I did a, a short video on hydrogen. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, let me try to get this on. Get this on. Okay, the, the, the first is that, and the first, and this is a key one. Hydrogen is not an energy source, okay? It takes uh, another energy source to create the hydrogen. And so it's not a replacement for any of the current energy sources. Uh, it's only a replacement for certain applications of those energy sources where you can't capture the, heart, the, the carbon at the end use application. Uh, number two is it uh, takes us more, more than three times as much primary energy uh, to get uh, green hydrogen from, from hydrolysis of water than it does to get blue hydrogen with, with carbon capture from the uh, uh, methane reformation. So methane reformation, blue hydrogen is just math and physics wise, it's the right way to go. Um, and uh, the final one is that, again, it's applications we've talked about is going to be, you know, mainly on the, the transportation and heavy equipment end. Uh, it's not a replacement for a current grid grid scale energy source. All right. Well, I appreciate your time today and uh, shedding some light on an issue that's been, uh, you know, discussed quite a bit in New Mexico and uh, your perspective. Not, not very on well that. understood. Obviously, uh, even all of us are still learning about it. So, yeah, uh, sounds like it. So I'm glad I'm not alone. And uh, now our <laughs> listeners know a lot more about it. So uh, right. thanks for right, listening Paul. to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube and Rumble channels. Subscribe to this show at Apple, Stitcher, have your Google Home play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.